I did. watched what happened yeah. in the United States with Trump and Clinton, I thought people liked the, they liked the unscripted, impulsive lies of Trump better than the scripted, instrumental lies of Clinton. I think part of what happened to Trump was that that tough part of him played well, especially to working class people. And I think that there was an element of that that was very genuine, especially contrasted with Hillary Clinton and the Democrats, uh, what would you call it, patronizing attitude towards working class people. Jordan Peterson delves into the controversy and complexity surrounding Donald Trump, revealing surprising insights about his rise to power and the polarizing effects that he has on society. I don't think that he's a psychopath. Um, because he's been successful in repeated enterprises over long periods of time, and he has a variety of people who are remain intensely loyal to him. Now, he's definitely extroverted in a, a very, to a very great degree, and he's definitely disagreeable. As contentious as their relationship may be, Jordan Peterson's thoughts on Donald Trump reveal a complex and fascinating intersection between politics and psychology, leaving us wondering, can we truly understand one without the other? Trump is uh, an anomaly, in my estimation. Um, he isn't a typical Republican. He's quite bombastic and assertive. He's not a typical conservative. In fact, he wasn't a conservative, I don't think, he's at all before. He's a Democrat, I well, think. Uh, yeah. He, yeah, and he's got an entrepreneurial bent as yeah. well, and entrepreneurial types tend to be liberal. So he's a strange, he's a strange person. He's an, he's an, he's an, uh, an idiosyncratic person. And the one thing I would say in his favor, as far as I'm concerned so far, is that he has not embroiled the U.S. in an additional stupid war. And that's happened a lot in the last 15 years, and the fact that that hasn't happened so far, I'm quite happy about. As one of the most influential thinkers of our time, Jordan Peterson's insight on politics and leadership are highly sought after. And when he speaks about Donald Trump, it's impossible not to feel the weight of his analysis and the depth of his understanding of the issues at play. And so I wonder with Trump if he's been, so he's pushed into a corner because of all the vitriol. The bullying and braggadocio tendency has become exaggerated. Maybe he's more surrounded by sycophants now than might be helpful. Now, I don't know that for sure, but it looks to me like something that like that is happening. I didn't say that Trump's record was unblemished mm. or that there weren't skirmishes of various sorts. I'm not trying to paint him uh, I'm not trying to paint him beige, and, or I'm not trying to whitewash him. I'm perfectly aware of Trump's flaws and his advantages. But he didn't embroil the U.S. in a war. And you guys have been embroiled in a pointless war for, for what? How long now? Since the 1960s? One after uh, another. And then the yeah. Abraham <laughs> Accords are a big deal. And so, and did he betray the working class? Well, I think that's in some sense a vague, it's a vague question. Hillary definitely betrayed the working class because she decided to go with the woke mob instead of her typical, in typic, in, instead of the typical base of power wow. that the Democrats had always relied on. I think it's a strategic error on his part, at minimum. I mean, Trump portrays himself and thinks of himself as a winner. And part of his attractiveness on the populist front was his unabashed, victorious persona let's say. And he's the guy that gets things done, and he's the guy that wins. But apparently, the election was stolen from him. And so that begs the question, are you the winner and the guy that gets things done, or are you the guy that lets things be stolen from you? <laughs> and the answer that Trump had always had was, well, I'm not the guy. I'm not that guy. I don't know who else I am, but I'm definitely the winner here. And I think that now campaigning as if he was the uh, victim, let's say, of a plot isn't going to do him any good. I think it was probably a fatal decision from a strategic perspective because mm. it's so off-brand. And that has nothing, that's completely independent of whatever virtue the argument about the stolen election might have. Well, I don't believe that the, that the judiciary in the United States is so corrupt that the, the possibility of a valid finding on the election fraud front has been reduced to zero. I don't find that credible. And then I do think, so I also think that that's, it's a mistake on that front. And it's a mistake for conservatives 
a real mistake for conservatives to take that route because conservatives can't say all the institutions are corrupt and untrustworthy. That's what the radical leftists say. And populist conservatives tend to do that. And that really leaves them with nothing except maybe an appeal to public whim. And that's no way to govern. So I think that was a mistake too. Here's my dilemma with Trump, one of many. Um, he's beating the election was stolen drum pretty damn hard. And I look at that as an outsider again, because I'm Canadian, and I think, well, you Americans, you've been split 50-50 for like five decades, like right down the middle, eh? And there's always election trouble, because no system is 100% perfect. Maybe there's like a 1%, 2% margin of crookedness, something like that. And you're probably really not going to get rid of that. Maybe you can maneuver carefully to keep it so that it's never any more than one or two percent but to get rid of that last bit of malfeasance and deception and corruption would take such a heavy hand that that would become worse than the problem that's a real problem when you're split 50 50 because small election irregularities can throw the whole election okay so it isn't obvious precisely what can be done about that but the election was stolen narrative, I think it's weak for a variety of reasons. The first is, it's pretty whiny. Like, why didn't you win with 5% margin then? So, how do you know this isn't your fault? And you think the Republicans aren't gerrymandering congressional districts? Because they are. And so it's not obvious that even if it is the case that there is substantive election fraud, that it's all from one side. And so there's that. And then, you're sure that's the message you want to be sending people? That they shouldn't have faith in their most fundamental institution? You might be right, but... But, it's in your interest for that to be true. And so that's a moral hazard. And then, well, what happens when you retake the House? Because that's what's going to happen, I think. The Democrats are going to get stomped in the, in the upcoming election. Are those elections somehow valid, but yours wasn't? And so, why magically, when the Republicans get elected, that's honest, but when they don't, it's not? And so doesn't that take the wind out of your story? It's like, well, it was stolen. Well, you have the House and the Senate. How do you account for that? So that, to me, that, that's going to weaken that narrative. Trump is capitalizing on anger. He's using the election issue as a means to an end. And he may believe it, but it doesn't matter because it's a weak story. What I've been able to understand, he's also very conscientious and hardworking, for example. And so that's a real mitigating factor. And so I think it's, it's very easy to demonize someone that you don't approve of, let's say. And certainly Trump has been subject, I would say, to more demonization than any political leader in the West that I can remember in my entire lifetime, including Richard Nixon. And so that's also set him back on his heels and made him somewhat embattled and defensive, which I don't think did any great things for, for his personality in some real sense. So I think it's a mistake to assume that, that uh, Trump is a psychopath. I think it's a big mistake. I think it's a big mistake to assume that Putin is a psychopath. It's easy to do that, but I don't think the evidence suggests that. You don't want to throw those labels around casually. And, you know, for... If, if Trump was psychopathic, well, he did a pretty good job of keeping the United States clear of war for four years. That's pretty damn remarkable. And he did have a big hand in promoting the Abraham Peace Accords, and that was pretty remarkable. And those aren't the sorts of things that you would expect he, from a psychopath. He also seems to have a pretty good hand with the working class. No, I, I don't think it would be good for America. Would it be good for him to run? That's a, dif that's a difficult question because it might be that it would be good for America to have whether or not Donald Trump should be president sorted out in the public sphere, yeah. debated intensely and subject to an election. So it might be very interesting to see him put himself forward on the Republican ticket. If I had my druthers, um, and I say this, I hope with due care, I would rather see someone like DeSantis step forward who mm. shares some of that forthright um, um, strength, let's say, that characterizes Trump at his best, but seems to be a, a more uh, cautious administrator and mm -hmm. a less divisive figure. I think that would be better because the, 
Trump for whatever virtues he might have, and I think he has the virtues of a Washington outsider, I think that's quite clear. I think that his, his behavior in the political realm raises the political temperature to a dangerous degree. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I say that while trying to give the devil his due and not casting careless aspersions on his, on his yeah. name. <laughs> yeah. so when like I watched you. what happened yeah. in the United States with Trump and Clinton, I thought, People like the, they like the unscripted, impulsive lies of Trump better than the scripted, instrumental lies of Clinton. What do you so, mean by that? Well, <laughs> Trump Trump gave a different speech generally when he went from audience to audience. He kind of shoots from the hip, kind of, <laughs> a lot. And it isn't obvious to me that shooting from the hip is really the right way to lead a country. But calculating everything beforehand for maximum impact on your political future, that is not also not a way to run a country. And that's how you get pulled into politics by handler, by PR, by, by opinion poll, by image. We have, you know, you see politicians, we have to protect our image. It's like, really, do you? You have to protect your image, do you? What, what's your image exactly? Well, <laughs> it's what we want people to think we are. Well, how about you be that? instead of being the image of that. Trump, the Trump phenomena, phenomenon probably worries me less than people think it should. But there are reasons for that. The first reason is that I don't really think that the American people are more polarized now than they were 10 years ago. And the reason I think that is because for 20 years, 50% of them have voted for Republicans. 50% of them have voted for Democrats. It hasn't moved. It's been exactly the same. Now this time they had Clinton and Trump as candidates and perhaps that was unfortunate. He's noisy. He's provocative, that's for sure. He seems impulsive, um, although it's hard to tell how much of that is crafted, you know. Um, he's definitely disagreeable, which is quite interesting and that, that comes out in his Twitter behavior and so forth, and in the way that he handles his political allies, for that matter. He's certainly not currying favor, and you can make the case that he's a divisive figure, and, and perhaps that's the case. I think part of what happened to Trump was that that tough part of him played well, especially to working class people, and I think that there was an element of that that was very genuine, especially contrasted with Hillary Clinton and the Democrats, uh, what would you call it, patronizing attitude towards working class people. And Trump could speak to people directly and he had that bluntness that disarmed them in some sense and made them believe that he was, at least in, in many ways, dealing an honest hand. Now, he suffered a tremendous amount of assault through vitriol when he was running for president and when he was president, probably more than any president that I can remember, including Richard Nixon, who I think might have run second for having most abuse dumped on him. And whether or not that's deserved is independent. I think in Trump's case, it was, it was over the top in quite a remarkable way. And so I think that that probably elicited more of that bullying behavior that might be perhaps a weakness. I've been trying to understand him and the bullying, the last interview you did with him, I believe, one of the things I noted about Trump was that he would do something about every 10 minutes that was markedly out of the ordinary conversationally. And so I watch for that because I'm a clinician. And so I always watch people talk to see when they're going off script, let's say, because there's always something underneath that. Make statements that are way over the top. So I think he said, for example, when you were interviewing something like, I tell the truth more than anyone ever has in history. Or he's, and then he said about 10 minutes later, something like, I've run the best administration in American history. And they're over the top preposterous statements. And they have this self aggrandizing element that's got a juvenile flavor to it. And I'm not doing a global critique of Trump's personality because I suspect, as you've already indicated, that he's a multifaceted person. But there's an element of him that's it's, he's got this 10-year-old bully part of him that also has a, um, 
a compensatory element. And so to say, you know, I tell the truth more than anyone has in history or something along those lines, I think, well, like, who are you comparing yourself here to exactly? Like, you, you tell the truth more than Jesus Christ. You run a better administration than Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. <laughs> and and it, it's marked because people don't generally do that in conversation, right? They don't come out with a preposterous statement about how remarkable they are with some degree of regularity. And now it seems to me to be associated with some other tendencies that he has. Like he has a tendency to nickname people and he has unerring accuracy in doing that and it can be devastating. Because I also think, and I've talked to lots of Republicans about this, is that the best story you've got? You got tradition on your side. You got the truth as an adventure on your side. You got belief in truth on your side. That's been abandoned by the radical left. You got belief in science on your side. You've got responsibility on your side. You've got the fundamental purpose of higher education on your side. You can't conjure up a better story for Americans than the election was stolen when, with all that on your side. That's just not very impressive. The West is fundamentally best characterized as an oppressive patriarchy, which is an absolutely, it's absolutely absurd proposition. I'm against the use of, of legislation to determine what words are that myself and other people are required to utter. In the crucible of societal debate, Jordan Peterson emerges as a fearless warrior, fearlessly taking on the complexities surrounding transgender issues that have gripped the world in a vice of uncertainty. We've accepted this preposterous hypothesis that your identity is only subjectively defined. And as I've tried to point out on some of my in some of my lectures, the only people who think their identity is subjectively defined are two-year-olds. And I mean that technically, mm -hmm. because two-year-olds are egocentric, which means they can't bring their identity in alignment with a, a social norm, which also means that two-year-olds can't play with other children. They can play beside them, but they can't play with them. That doesn't happen until you're three. And what happens when you're three, if you're reasonably well socialized or start to move towards that, is that you learn how to negotiate a social identity. Mm. And then identity becomes, obviously it has a root, some roots in your subjectivity and in your biology for that matter, but a sophisticated identity is not only socially negotiated as the constructivists know perfectly well, but it's also, it's got a dynamism about it because it has to be constantly renegotiated. With the weight of controversy on his shoulders, Peterson dares to tread where others fear to go, questioning the prevailing narratives and offering a thought-provoking perspective that challenges the very foundations of our understanding. It's a terrible problem. So imagine, you know, imagine you, okay, so the rule is you can't offend anyone, all right? Let's say you're speaking to one person, I can't offend you. All right, fair enough. What if I'm speaking to 10 people? Do I get to offend one in 10? How about one in 100? How about one in 1,000? You're gonna come out on stage and you're gonna say something important about something vital and you're not going to offend one person in a thousand? Well, you can't say anything about anything important ever without offending probably the person you're talking to. Important speech about important issues, especially contentious issues, is instantly offensive. Like a lone voice in a storm, Peterson's unwavering commitment to intellectual honesty shines through as he delves into the intricate nuances of gender identity refusing to succumb to the pressures of political correctness. Bill C-16 purported to do nothing but extend human rights provisions to an excluded group, let's say, to, to the transgender and non-gender binary types, and, and that was the federal legislation. It also made it a hate crime to, to, to discriminate or harass, essentially. So now then the question is, well, what exactly do you mean by discriminate or harass? And why exactly is that a hate crime under the criminal code? Well, there was an answer to that. The answer was, well, this bill will be interpreted in light of the policies generated by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Very large set of policies. Now, the Ontario Human Rights Commission is a radically leftist organization. I think it's the most dangerous organization in Canada, although you could debate that. And they set all sorts of policies about how this, these le this legislation was going to be interpreted. And the federal government linked to their website to state that Bill 16, C-16 would be interpreted in light of those guidelines. 
So I went and read all the policies. Well, one of the policies was that if you didn't use the preferred pronouns of a given group, that you could be charged essentially with a hate crime. And I thought, no, Wait, that's Which given no. group is that? You're talking about transgender people. Yeah, and yeah. so there's all these pronouns that have come up. There's 70 different sets of pronouns approximately to, to hypothetically describe people who don't fit anywhere on the gender spectrum, which is also something that I don't really understand. I don't understand that conceptually. With each carefully chosen word, Peterson unveils the ethical and psychological complexities of the transgender discourse, forcing us to confront uncomfortable truths that lie at the heart of our understanding of identity and societal norms. Well, I think, I think that is what I'm offering. I, that, that's not part of the public discussion. You know, and it's grounded in my clinical knowledge. So I've been a clinician for a very long time, and I'm familiar with the works of most of the great 20th century clinicians and a reasonable amount of philosophy and a good swath of literature. And I'm a credible scientist, and so I can bring that all together. And I've tried to bring it all together and to make a case for the significance of individual life and the psychological necessity of courage and nobility and responsibility, these things that sound old-fashioned, but are old-fashioned in the best sense. They're old-fashioned because they've lasted forever and they're absolutely necessary. And people need a call to responsibility because they need to mature. They need to want to be adults. You know? And I don't think we do a very good job in our culture of making a case for why it's a good thing to be an adult. And two things really made you famous, which is, first of all is the book, 12 Rules for Life. Mm -hmm. The second one, I think, was a, an interview that went viral with Kathy Newman of, of Channel 4 News, which mm -hmm. she talked about Joe men Rogan's and women. podcasts help plenty. Too. Right, he's got a big, big following. But that was, I think, really fascinating, that interview, because it was specifically mm -hmm. about men and women. And you said at the time, you know, YouTube skews very male and your fan base is very male. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? Are you still mostly primarily talking to men? Um, I would say the talks are probably 60, 40, 65, 35 male to female. The book sales, I don't know. I doubt it because it's usually it's women who buy books, although men do buy nonfiction if they buy books. We don't know the demographics on the books. Um, but the book has definitely expanded my um, audience, I would say. Um, and that's a good thing, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I never set out specifically to talk to men. My students, for most years at university, have been primarily female. I think most of my graduate students have been female. It might be about 50-50, but I think it would probably tilt more in the direction of female. So it wasn't like it wasn't something I set out to do. Um, I think, though, that as I said earlier, as we're having a conversation here, to some degree we're renegotiating our mutual identities because we learn something from each other, right. and so we transform. Right. We're also trying to figure out to some degree who each of us is in this situation. And then we're also trying to learn, can we play together towards some productive end? And you might ask, well, what do you mean play? And say, well, we're trying to have an interesting conversation. That's a form of play. And if you won't negotiate, and I won't negotiate, how in the world are we gonna have a conversation? Well, this is the whole problem with the, the transgender debate, particularly in things like sport, is that there's simply no willingness on the part of the transgender part of this debate to have any conversation about potential unfairness well, we, we created by what's happening. And yeah. I say, you've gotta have the conversation. Yeah, but we, we talked about that earlier. The people who really push this, or, or the ideas that govern this, was a better way of thinking about it, there is no, this is a very difficult thing to understand. You think there's such a thing as reasonable conversation. Mm. That's not on the table for the radicals. No, it's not. See, reason, the, I, the, your notion of reasonable conversation is nothing but your insistence that your ethos is dominates. And their response is always, well, then you're transphobic. Yeah, well. Uh, yeah. Or you're racist, or you're both. Or you're a biological essentialist or some Whatever it is. That as a consequence, whatever actions they might take that are forthright and ambitious in terms of participating in that system are by, by, by the very nature of the system destructive. It's very difficult for me to understand how anybody can be properly motivated if that's the fundamental view of society and, and male participation in it. And I don't buy any of that. I think the idea that the West is fundamentally an oppressive patriarchy is an appalling idea and the notion that the proper way to view history is as a battleground between ethnic identities or identities in general or between men and women is it borders on the pathological. And so maybe it exceeds just merely bordering on the pathological. I 
tell people consistently is that they have to look to themselves. And, and it's not because I believe that people are in full control of their lives. You know, we're all subject to bad breaks and sometimes to terrible luck, but your best bet is to do what you can, to take care of yourself properly, to treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping, which is rule two, by the way. Partly because I do believe in this ancient, fundamentally Western idea that people are of intrinsic value. I mean, look, we're all given the sovereign right to organize our own states, the responsibility to vote. Our, our state, our very state assumes that you have the wisdom to keep the ship of state sailing straight. And it's because there's something about you that, at least in principle, has the possibility of being remarkable if it can be manifested. And I'm reminding people that, that not only do we believe that, but that it seems to be true. And it isn't obvious to me that there is anyone, or there has been anyone for the last four or five decades, let's say, who's done a credible job of drawing a relationship between the meaning in life that you need to sustain you and responsibility. And not just for you, because it's not an individualistic idea. It's responsible for you, responsibility for you and your family Coming up to and a your community. There, That'll do the trick. <laughs> and your broader society. I don't think it boils down to respecting their human rights. I think that it's an imposition on freedom of speech that's being implemented at a legislative level. I also think that if there was a naturally um, evolving uh, solution to the linguistic problem that's being posed by a small fraction of the transgender community that people would have already adopted it. We've never had a situation with in, with in, in, in the usage of English before that required legislation to produce a transformation in the manner in which people spoke has a very dangerous precedent. So it's one thing to tell people what they can't say. So for example, we have legislation um, making it illegal to do such things as deny the Holocaust. It's a completely different thing to demand that people use certain words when they're formulating their own ideas. And I, I mean, I can get, it's also absurd. I mean, here's one ha thing that's happened that I don't believe the formulators of this legislation ever foresaw. So in New York City, for example, there are now 31 protected gender identities. And I see no reason whatsoever why each of those gender identities can't de demand the use of their own pronoun. And that, uh, absurd things like that have been happening on the University of Michigan campus, for example, where students have been given permission to tell faculty members and others what pronouns they're to be addressed by. And they're multiplying rapidly out of control. So the law is bad from an ethical perspective. It's sloppily written. And besides that, the solution that it imposes is practically untenable. True, yeah, you can actually try listening when you're, when you're having a conversation, right? Assuming that both people who are having the conversation are of good will, and they're not trying to play tricks, and they're struggling towards the truth, which neither of them hold completely, and both understand that. Yeah, you can reach across fairly large gaps and negotiate peace. Thank God for that, or we'd be at each other's throats all the time. Well, say the example of there are some transgender people who want to not be referred to as he or she. They would prefer to be called Z or they. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody wants to be addressed like that, what does it cost me to do that? It's hard to tell because it, the devil's always in the details, but as far as I'm concerned, that's, that situation is, it's, it's not relevant to the issues, for example, that I was involved in. I didn't care if transgender people wanted to be called by some pronouns, like whatever, that's something for individuals to negotiate. When the, when the government makes that a compulsion and insists in their legislation that biological sex, uh, gender identity, gender expression and sexual proclivity very independently, it's like, no, they don't. That's wrong factually, and you're not gonna compel my speech. I don't care what your damn justification is. So you see that as, am I right in, that you see that as a curtailing of freedom? It's worse than a curtailing of freedom. It's a demand that the population uses a certain kind of linguistic approach. It's, a, it's an appropriation of speech. There's no excuse for that. That never has happened once in the history of English common law, right? It's a barrier that we do not cross. Hate speech laws are bad enough. It's not like there's no hate speech. Like anyone with any sense knows that there's hate speech. Who's gonna regulate it? Who's gonna define it? And I know the answer to that. The last people in the world you would want to. And then we, we cross another barrier and we allow the government to compel speech for some hypothetically compassionate reason? No way. That's a really bad idea. I can't tell how much of it is merely a consequence of the fact that YouTube skews so male. 
It might also be something to do with the call to take on voluntary responsibility. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that would be more necessary for men right now. I think it might be because our culture confuses men's desire for achievement and competence with the patriarchal desire for tyrannical power. And that's a big mistake. Those aren't the same thing, even a bit. So, and it's very inappropriate psychologically and sociologically to confuse them. So. Well, one of the things I want to come back to is this idea. So that you say in the book, you know, there is masculine order and feminine chaos. Mm -hmm. I, no, actually, I say that those are symbolic representations of the two things. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So why? Why is order masculine? Um, I think it's because our primary social hierarchy structures are fundamentally masculine. And that's not the patriarchy? Well, it's not the modern idea of the patriarchy, that's for sure. I mean, that's, so that's my idea of the patriarchy, which is a, a system of male dominance of society. Yeah, but that's not my sense of the patriarchy. So what's, what's yours? Well, in what sense is our society male dominated? Uh, the fact that the vast majority of wealth is owned by men, the vast majority of capital and is owned by men. Women do more unpaid it's a very, labor. Very tiny proportion of men, and a huge proportion of people who are seriously disaffected are men. Most people in prison are men. Most people who are uh, on the street are men. Most victims of violent crime are men. Most people who commit suicide are men. Uh, most men, most people who die in wars are men. People who do worse in school are men. It's like. Where's the dominance here, precisely? What you're doing is you're taking a tiny substrata of hyper-successful men and using that to represent the entire structure of, the, of Western society. There's nothing about that that's vaguely appropriate. But I could say equally well that most rape victims are women. You know, terrible things happen to people of both sexes. And you could say that with, with, with perfect utility, but that doesn't provide any evidence for the existence of a male-dominated patriarchy. Well, there it are... just means that terrible things happen to both genders, which they certainly do. But there are almost no women who rape men, for example. So that is an asymmetry there in sexual violence. Well, yes, there's an, as there's an asymmetry in all sorts of places, but that doesn't mean that Western culture is a male-dominated patriarchy. The fact that there are asymmetries has nothing to do with your basic argument.